Tremblay from CU last. Um, she will be uh, speaking on derivation of boundary conditions for data driven simulations of active regions and uh, quiet sun. Um, Benoit Tremblay received um, in 2019 his PhD in solar physics from the Université de Montreal in Montreal, Canada, under the guidance of professors Alan Vincent and Paul Charbonneau. His thesis explored data assimilation in simulations and the use of deep learning and neural networks in conjunction with magnetohydrodynamic simulation to generate synthetic observations of quantities like plasma velocities at the surface of the sun. He then joined in 2019 the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics in Boulder, Colorado, as a George Ellery Hell postdoctoral fellow to work with professors Maria Kazachenko and Benjamin Brown. Finally, in mid September 2022, a, a few weeks away, Benoit will be joining HO to work with Anna Malanushenko and Matthias Rempel on the derivation of boundary conditions for data-driven simulations via deep learning. I turn it to uh, Ben. Thank you, Hussein. Share my screen. OK. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, so. For today's presentation, although the title is talking about data-driven simulations and boundary conditions, I'll mainly focus just on the first part of the title, which is the derivation of flows, as the rest is mainly going to be part of the work that I'll be doing at HO starting in a couple of weeks. So this is more of the motivation, uh, but look, we'll look mainly at the flows. And this all stems from the fact that uh, our understanding of a lot of crucial aspects in solar physics, from things like the evolution of magnetic fields to the prediction of space weather events, uh, really depends on how we can utilize um, observations to numerically model some of the physical processes that operate in the sun's photosphere and, and its atmosphere. Um, and photospheric flows are thought to play a major role in some of the solar phenomena. Uh, but some of the challenges are that direct observations of some of its components um, are, are not easily accessible. Um, so we need to find ways to um, augment our knowledge of, of what plasma flows are. So in terms of an outline for the presentation, um, we'll, we'll first talk with a bit of a motivation as to why we're interested in, in plasma flows and mainly what we call transverse flows, so flows that are transverse to a line of sight. Um, then I'll, we'll explore uh, the methodology for the derivation of those flows, which is mainly um, using deep learning in this case. Um, and I'll provide some examples. And here I, I put a bunch, so depending on time, I might skip over. Um, I think we'll keep it loose um, if people have questions or stuff like that, just feel free to interrupt. It's mainly, for me, this is mainly an opportunity to meet with the folks at HO uh, and introduce some of the things that I've worked on or I'll be working on. Um, so for those examples, uh, we'll, I'll present a few, and then I'll present some examples of actually um, trying to apply some of those ideas to, to actual observations, not just synthetic data, uh, but trying to go, for example, for, for HMI data. And then finally, we'll move on to um, some conclusions and perspectives uh, for, for the future. So why are we interested in, in transverse flows? Well, with some of the missions that we have currently, we, we have data products like Dopper grams that inform us about how plasma is moving along the line of sight, so away or towards the, the observer. But when it comes to the how plasma is moving in the direction transverse to the line of sight, unfortunately, we, we can't measure this directly. Uh, we need to infer it in some way. So on the left, we have examples of, of observations, uh, like topograms look like. On the right is an example of, say, what we could try to do in terms of deriving transverse flows. Um, but in terms of the, the science, so, so why do people care about those transverse flows? Um, well, we know that photospheric flows contribute to the pumping of magnetic energy from the solar surface to the solar atmosphere, uh, where that energy can then be stored and dissipated. And this, in turn, can contribute to, to flares, coronal mass ejections, or eating of the sun's uh, outer layers. Um, so photospheric flow maps are, are kind of a, an essential component in the quantification of the pointing flux uh, of the magnetic energy that enters the corona 
um, from the photosphere. And we have an example on the right of trying to estimate that point influx in a quiet sun. And that is work that was done by uh, Dennis Tillitman at CU Boulder. Um, yeah, where he, he, he used transverse map, uh, transverse flow estimations that were done through deep learning and then combining that with magnetograms to try to estimate um, what a point influx is like in the quiet sun. Um, but there's other things that we can use this for. For example, um, there, there's a group at the University of Sheffield that's dedicating their work to, to looking at some of the patterns that we find in the flows and see if we can have a detection of a pre-emergence or like signatures of pre-emergence of, of active regions thanks to the study um, of those patterns. And then finally, uh, and, and this is the main motivation in, in, in this presentation and from for and for why I'll be joining HAO soon, it is that with, with flows or uh, by extension electric fields, uh, we can use those as, as boundary conditions for data-driven simulations of the sun. So this allows us to make models of what the solar atmosphere would be like, try to recreate a, a case that we get from observations, but, but using our simulations. And, and one of the main uh, projects that's motivating this for us is uh, something related to um, what Annie calls the kernel veil theory. Um, so just to give a, a brief overview, I'm not going to go into detail about this. You can ask Annie for all the all the details, but uh, using simulations, there's there's been a bit of a, um, a simulations recently kind of challenge our perspective of what coronal loops are. So if if we look at um, EUV emission uh, from observations, it, it's line of sight integrated. So you get structures kind of like what you're seeing in the background. And we're used to seeing these thin structures that we call the coronal loops and that we associate with thin magnetic flux, flux tubes. Um, but if we look at something like simulations, uh, we not only have access to the line of sight integrated uh, emission, but we also have access to the volumetric emission. So for example, um, if, if we have this square here, um, it's showing us um, the, the volumetric emission and then the background showing you the line of sight integration of it. And if you look on the right, as you can see, um, it's not necessarily clear that it's thin structures that are creating um it's not thin structures in the volume that are creating the, the thin structures that we're seeing kind of in the line of sight integration it could be that it's actually thicker structures uh but they have irregular boundaries and as a result as you do the line of sight um, integration it, it it appears as though you're getting those thin structures but it's more of a kind of a projection artifact or it could be some thin structures but they're kind of like like veils and what you're seeing is wrinkles as you do the line of sun integration. So we have observations. We can look at those, the properties of a lot of coronal loops um, and, and, and extract that. Uh, but then we can also make data-driven simulations of, of those active regions and, and, and see what the, the structures that they create. Um, so from other observations, we get the line of sight integrations. And then from the data-driven simulations, we have access to the volumetric um, Mission that will allow us to try and find which, which scenarios make more sense depending on each case. Could it be is it kernel loops as we expect, or could it be thicker structures? Could it be veil like structures, et cetera? So, we're working on uh, Matthias has been working on the modification of um, Murem so we can use um, magnetograms um, from, from the photosphere in there, as well as uh, other quantities like the electric field or uh, flows that we can derive from observations. And those will be used as boundary conditions to drive the model. Um, that, but in terms of the whole data driving process, it, it's a motivation. So it's as far as I'm going to get uh, in, in terms of the details of that process. For now, we'll mainly focus on um, the flows themselves. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot this slide. But just to, to reiterate, like we have the observations, um, like here from, from SDO AIA, we see thin structures that look like loops. And if we do like, a cut across a slit, you see those peaks that we would normally associate with individual loops based on that uh, perspective. But it could be um, that depending on how we do line integration um, or the, the type of structure that we have, if we have a bunch of thin structures that are kind of like loops, um, this is the kind of profile we would get. But meanwhile, you could have something a bit thicker that would still give you uh, an interesting profile that could maybe be relatable to observations, or you could have a veil like structure. That again, as you do the line of sun integration, will provide you um, a profile that could be that could still be related to to what, to what we observe. 
Um, but yeah, now I'll move on to the actual flow. So when we look at um, observations uh, or, or the data products that we, we get from uh, missions, whether it's satellites or telescopes, we usually get things like the continuum intensity or, or white light intensity. We get magnetograms. Like in this case, this is a, a line of sub magnetogram of uh, AR1158. Um, and you can also measure, like I explained earlier, the um, line of sight velocity. But if you're interested in the transverse uh, components of the plasma motions, so transverse to line of sight, unfortunately, those you just don't get from the observations. Um, you have to derive them based on the other data products. So there's multiple ways of going about this. Um, if you want to infer them, you can one uh, use, for example, just intensity grams and do tracking or measure what we call optical flows. And optical flows are just their, their apparent motions. It is basically the displacement um, of features that you see when you're looking at two consecutive images. Um, and in some spatial scales, you'll see a really good correlation between the physical flows that you want to measure and these apparent motions or optical flows. Uh, but those are usually limited to, limited to larger than granular scales, so more like super granulation. There's a lot of methods that exist to, to, to do those estimates, like local correlation tracking, Fourier local correlation tracking, or ball tracking. Um, but those have been mainly uh, applied to the quiet sun when using intensity grams. But the same principle can still be applied to, to, to magnetograms. So you can switch the inputs, and that will allow you to estimate optical flows in active regions. Um, and this, this has been done a lot with Fourier local correlation tracking uh, and magnetic ball tracking as well. And then finally, you have physics-based methods. So rather than trying to estimate optical flows or apparent motions, you can try to estimate flows that we could call physical uh, as they satisfy a, a physical equation, like for most of these cases, uh, the magnetic induction equation, or at least a component of it, like the vertical component. And this will usually require the use of uh, magnetograms as well as Dopplergrams, because these are variables um, in the equations. And once you have that, you can then estimate the flows. Um, so there's a lot of methods that exist, but there's um, another that was introduced uh, a, a bit more recently. It's the, the idea of using uh, deep learning to do this. And this idea stems from the fact that from observations, like I explained earlier, we have access to some data products, but when it comes to the uh, transverse velocities, you, you don't. But if you look at something like simulations, you normally have access to all of those quantities, which is a, an advantage. Uh, so the idea here is that with uh, something like deep learning, you could try to learn, um, let's see if this works, uh, a mapping function that will allow you to take maybe one, two, or three, or combinations of all, all those different data products and try to, to map them into the um, velocity components that you're interested in because you have access to all of this information in, in the simulations. Um, of course, it comes with a few caveats, but I'll explain those uh, in a second. But in terms of deep learning, I really want to take time just to, to explain the whole idea behind it. I don't want to treat this as a black box. Um, so let, let's slowly uh, talk about neural networks. And, and to, to really make it simple, uh, just to get the principle across, let's start with just a single neuron. So the idea is that, um, in a neural network, usually you'll have a layer of inputs. So these are the things that you provide. Like in this case, like I showed earlier, it could be an intensity gram, a doppler gram, um, or uh, a, a magnetogram. There's a there's going to be something in the middle, something that we call an hidden layer, which in this case is just a single neuron for simplicity. And then at the end, you'll have your output. In our case, it would be the components of the plasma velocity, which is what we're interested in. But the way this works um, is, is basically what a neural network will do is that you provide your inputs, uh, you will apply a weight to each of those inputs, uh, which is represented, for example, here by the, the vector w. Um, then you add a bias. So basically, it's a very simple um, function that is basically just, yeah, here, here's, here's some input data, apply some, some weight to some of the features in it add a bias to shift things, and, and that's it. You get an, an output. Um, and then you can apply to this what we call an activation function. Um, this is just to make things a bit more complex. For example, it could be a sinusoid. It could be just uh, 
an identity uh, function. It's just so you can make some sort of uh, uh, function that is more complex, or, or, or for most cases, where we're interested in having something that's non-linear. Um, but in general, the principle I just want to get across with this is that uh, a neural network is just an analytical function. You can you can write it down. Um, it's just very unconventional in its structure. It's it's not like a polynomial where you can easily be like, okay, we'll just use this this many terms, and and we we're kind of used to working with those. Here, it it, it can get uh, very complex and ugly quickly, and I'll show an example of that. Uh, but basically, as you write a neural network architecture, what you're saying is you're you're specifying what kind of function uh, or approximation you want to use, and then uh, through the training process. Uh, which we'll get to in a minute as well, what you're doing is you're adjusting some of the parameters of that function. So like the weights and the bias are the things that you're tweaking. Um, and this allows you to, 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 to make a function that fits your needs. So this is an example with a single neuron. But as you can imagine, uh, you can have multiple neurons. And basically, what the output of this layer can become the input of another layer, which will be then activation function of this stuff inside. So it, it, it can get quickly more complex. So you can have uh, more and more stuff. So again, we have our input layers. Now our the the part in the middle is is now more complex. There's more neurons connecting one to each other. So the output of one becomes the input of another one, and so the function becomes a lot more complicated, uh, which might allow you to to make a better representation of the, the thing that you're trying to capture. And then at the end, you have your output layer. And then once you have your output, uh, th th this is where we can start talking about the training process. Is that um, there, there's a loss function where your apple will go in, and basically you're, you're going to want to optimize that loss function, and this is how you're going to determine how to modify uh, the free parameters like the weights and biases in, in the previous layers. In our case, like we were talking about flows and simulations. So we have access to the flows and the simulations. We would like to be able to recreate them. So when we're, look, we're looking at a loss function, basically what we're doing is our neural network is producing an estimate of those flows. And then we're comparing them to the flows in the simulation, which is what it should be able to recreate. Basically, you're going to try to optimize that match as best as possible to optimize your, um, your function here. Um, so, so that's generally how, how, how it is approached. Um, in terms of images, however, because the data that we're using here are, are images, 2D images typically, or, or movies. It could be multiple images at multiple time steps. Uh, rather than working with stuff like neurons, um, we're, we're working with something that's called a kernel. So we're using what we call convolutional neural networks. Um, so uh, basically what you're doing is, for example, let's assume that the thing on the left is, is an image and it has values in it. Um, you're going to be applying filters um, to, this Im to that image to try and identify um, features or uh, structures that are more important um, or that are going to be more relevant in terms of uh, learning something or in terms of making that um, mapping function that you're interested in. And so the filters or the kernels are the things that you'll be optimizing. So those are going to be looking for lines, edges, textures, and things like that. So think, for example, in terms of solar granulation, there, there, there's that very distinct pattern. So those kernels will be looking for some of those features. Um, and then once you have that, basically you get a filtered image, and at the end that we, that could end up being, for example, our, our flows thing that we're, that we're interested. In. And when it comes to using deep learning to infer flows, there there there's a few that exist. There's a few neural networks that do that. Uh, it started with the Deval neural network by Andres Asensoramos. Uh, there was a small modification that was done to it by uh, myself and my collaborator Rafael Atier Goddard. Um, and then finally, th there's a more recent one called Multiscale uh, by Ryotaro Ishikawa uh, in Japan, which seems to improve over the other neural networks in terms of better capturing the multiple spatial scales that exist in, in solar data. Um, but the goal in this presentation for me is not going to be to compare those methods. We'll actually focus just on the first one on the left, uh, DEVAL, just so that we can get the principle across and, and talk about some of the what, what works and some of the pitfalls as well of, of those methods. Uh, but just to summarize what we have basically for our problem, we're, we're looking to try to reconstruct transverse velocities. And we're looking to do so at a specific optical or geometrical depth. 
Um, and for this, we're going to try to to use a neural network to learn a mapping function that's going to take a series of inputs. It could be intensity grams, magnetic grams, Doppler grams, or a combination of all of them uh, at a specific optical or geometrical depth. Um, and then, yeah, go to the transverse velocities for this. A quick couple of things about this, and it's, I think, one of the things that sets neural networks apart from the other methods. And by, by apart, I don't mean any better, I just mean different, is that we're, we have the possibility here of using data at one depth and try to reconstruct flows at a depth that's different. We're not restricted to where the data is. We can actually try to map at different positions, which is pretty interesting. What that also implies is that we're not limited to uh, making 2D maps of transverse velocities. We can actually try to generate a volume. Again, because we have access to that information in the simulations. Simulations usually allow us to get flows at multiple depths. So if you want to learn a mapping function from a 2D slice to a volume, you can try to do so. Um, I didn't put examples in this presentation, but I have some that I can share with people offline if you're interested. Uh, but this is another interesting uh, property from the perspective, for example, of data-driven simulations, where your boundary condition now is not just a 2D slice, and you have to figure out how to include that in your model. You can actually try to generate a volume. It could be like a, say, if you need a upper convection zone, or if you need like um, a fraction of the photosphere, not just a, a slice from it, through deep learning, it's technically possible. You can you can give that a try. Um, another thing that we have to be careful about this is also the interpretation of, of your results. Um, so when you're doing this process, learning from simulations, or what we call supervised learning, it means that whenever you're uh, generating flows, those flows are probably going to be representative of what you trained on, of that simulation. And different simulations may have different approximations, uh, different assumptions. And so each time you're going to be producing an estimate, it's going to be reflecting whatever it is that you train on. So the interpretation of the flows that you're generating should be something like I wrote on the bottom. Um, so it's an approximation of what the flows would be like in the training simulation, so what you trained in, if the input data provided to the neural network were generated by that same training simulation. So there is a model dependency. Um, so if you, you trained, uh, you're expecting inputs to have similar properties to the simulation you trained on, and the outputs of the, the flows will be similar to the simulation that you trained on. If you try to use inputs that are different, um, it's still going to assume that it was from the training simulation. The neural network doesn't know any difference. Uh, so the output that it's going to generate is still going to be reflecting that training, training simulation. So when you're applying this to something like real observations, it means you have to be careful with interpretation. Um, but from a perspective of data-driven simulations or, or stuff like data simulation, this property could actually be kind of useful because one of the challenges that we have is that, yes, we need to derive flows from the observations, but we need those flows to then be consistent with the simulation itself, which is a, another challenge. But if you've learned from that same simulation you want to do the data driving in, then you might actually have something that's going to be consistent with it, which is interesting. Uh, so interesting from the perspective of data-driven simulations, you have to be careful, though, if you're applying this to observations and trying to do science out of it. You really have to be accounting for the interpretation. Um, and when it comes to simulations, there's a lot of simulations that you could try to learn from. Um, we have examples of neuron simulations, uh, stagger simulation, or data-driven simulations like we have at the bottom. So there's plenty of choice. Um, but for now, we're, we're just going to focus on one ex uh, first example. It's going to be the Muir 2019 simulation of a flaring active region. Well, we're going to try to learn from it, and then we're, we're going to see if we, we can actually recover it. So this is a, a best-case scenario kind of problem. Learn from the simulation and then try to recover that same simulation. And we're going to actually use this test case to, to see like what combinations of inputs should we be using to best recover those. Because like I've mentioned earlier, there's methods that usually focus on one or the other, or you might use a couple. Uh, but from the perspective of neural networks, we can try to use everything if you want. So we're, we're not limited to this. Um, so this is what the simulation looks like. Um, so it, it's an active region. It produces a flare at some point. Uh, we're not going to focus too much on the flare, per se. Uh, but just to give you an idea, th this is a simulation data. This is a magnetogram. And in addition to the magnetogram, we have access to the transverse, transverse flow components from it, uh, which I'm not showing. Um, but 
they're they're available. So we can try to learn a mapping function between something like this and those um, transverse flows. Um, we're going to focus on three specific subregions um, that are, are shown here. Uh, one that's mainly I'm calling it quite some, but it's it's not really quite some there. Uh, but just outside of the active region, um, we're going to focus on a more magnetically active subregion, and then another one where we have kind of a transition between two different polarities. And and the goal here is to show that those methods were were for, from from the perspective of deep learning were usually made for quite some. They were not made for stuff like active regions. And here we're trying to do that transition or generalization, try to capture everything. Um, and there's challenges depending on the type of features that we are looking at. So these are going to be three subfields we'll look at. Um, but for now, we'll just start with uh, the quiet sun to make it easier. So this is kind of like the usual scenarios that these deep learning methods have been used for in the past. So before I talk about all the details on the plot, I just want to show, I want to discuss what it is that we're seeing uh, in each of the panels, because uh, we're going to reuse that template a lot. First thing, there's going to be a, a dimension at the top of what's the training set. So what's the training simulation that was used? And when I say training simulation, what I mean is that we we, re we extracted random patches from that simulation at random times, in random positions. We're not learning from like a full image or something like that, because um, otherwise we don't want to just the neural network to replicate exactly what's happening. We just want to get to learn bits and pieces of it. Um, we'll then mention the test set, so what it is that it's applied to. In this case, it's the same simulation, but it's a patch of white sun. And I'll mention what the input data is that's currently being used. Like in this case, it is the continuum intensity, which is the classic input uh, when you're trying to infer flows for for quite some. The first panel that you'll see on the left is flows from the simulation. So this is our, our, our reference. This is what we'd like to be able to reproduce. So the arrows are the transverse flows. The background is the divergence of those transverse flows. So this is basically the derivatives. Again, it's just another thing that we can look at to, to help us see if we're able to recover the proper structures. The plot that's in the middle of your screen is the flows that were inferred by the neural network. So the arrows are inferred by the neural network. The background is the divergence of those arrows. So it's again, inferred by the neural network. And then in the upper right, um, we have a scatter plot um, that's comparing the simulation flows to the um, uh, neural network flows. And it has a few metrics for reference, like we have a Spearman correlation coefficient. We have uh, mean absolute errors. We have the median absolute percentage error. And we have what we call a, a cosine similarity index, which is a, a measure of the orientation between two vectors. So if it's close to one, it means the vectors are parallel, which is what, what we want. If it's zero, they're perpendicular, which is not good. And if it's minus one, it's anti-parallel, which is, again, not good. And we have the same thing at the bottom for the divergence. So just to give a, a, an idea of some of the things that we're using to assess performance. So now if we look at the flows themselves, um, in general, the, the neural network is kind of capturing the behavior you're expecting. In the sense that for granules, it is divergent inside granules, and it is convergent inside the intergranular lanes, um, which is nicely correlated with the divergence of the background. Um, so if you compare both, from, from that perspective, like the general behavior is there, but if you look at some of the smaller details, it's missing a few things. Um, specifically, like inside the granules, it's pretty smooth. Same thing inside the intergranular lanes. Whereas if you look at the simulation, there's a lot more variation. Um, so it's, it's, it's doing fine, but it, it could be better. And if we look at stuff like the scatter plots for both the divergence and, and, and the flows themselves, again, it seems to be capturing the general behavior, but there, where there's problems. Like in general, it seems to be underestimating the flows you should be finding. But we can try to change that by changing the inputs that we're using and see if it improves. Like in this case, we're going for an input that's a little unconventional when computing flows, um, and it's just the vertical velocity in the simulation. Or if you were to relate this to observations, it could be like something like a Dopplergram that's been processed to remove stuff like solar rotation, things like that. And, and if I flicker between the two, you can clearly see that there's a significant change from what it is that it captures. Um, how we're getting actually closer to, to the flows that we're expecting in the simulation. Um, so there seems to be a pretty like um, important impact in terms of what it is the input data that you use in terms of 
doing the mapping to the transverse flow. So it looks like learning from vertical velocity to go to the transverse velocity improved significantly over the classic input of using uh, continuum intensity, which is interesting. And this was also a finding from the uh, paper earlier this year by Ryotaro Ishikawa in his deep learning method, which also showed that using vertical velocity seems to improve over continuum intensity. But we don't have to stop there. We can then include the magnetic field if we want as well. So not just vertical velocity, but let's try to include bx, by, bz. Um, and again, there is an improvement, um, but it's not as much as, as before. It seems like a big change comes from the vertical velocity itself. Uh, but if we flicker just quickly between both, um, there, there is a change um, in, in terms of the metrics and, 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 and the features that we're finding, which is still pretty interesting. But then you could go all out and just provide everything. Um, like in this in this case, we also provide the continuum intensity, um, which in some cases kind of improves. In others, it doesn't really. It seems like at some point you might reach a point where there's too much information or it's too redundant. And and as a result, there's either no change or you might actually lose a bit of, of performance in some places. Um, like here, actually the divergence seems to be losing a bit um, in, in terms of performance, but not a whole lot. But it's still pretty interesting to see like the input or the, the influence of the different that uh, are involved in the mapping to the transverse flows. But in general for the quiet zone, I would say the behavior is there. It, it does a fairly good job at recovering the simulation, even though it's not perfect. But think of it, the neural network is meant to be an approximation. It, it's not going to be exactly the same, but it's still, it does fairly, fairly well. Next, we can move to something a, a little, maybe a little more interesting, um, which is a region that's more magnetically active, uh, which goes outside of what these neural networks have been used for before. Um, so again, the slide has the same structure as before, uh, but this time we're looking at that uh, subfield, which is more active. Um, so we have, again, the simulation on the left. In the middle, it is what the neural network can reconstruct. Um, and this time we're using, for example, as an input, BZ, which is a the quantities say that um, optical flow methods like Fourier local correlation tracking would use normally to infer flows inside active regions. So again, uh, if we look at both uh, in terms of the mapping functions, the behavior is there. Um, like what the simulation is expecting in terms of uh, the umbra, so very small flows, um, it, it's kind of captured by a neural network. If you move to this sort of penumbra, although it is basically smaller non-existent in the simulation. Uh, it, the simulation is expecting kind of inflows, and the neural network is seeing that. And as you get to the edges, sometimes you, you, you start hitting more like granular cells, and the behavior is, is kind of captured. So again, not perfect, but a, I'd say a fairly, like an approximation, that's fine. And then as you switch the inputs, um, again, I'll flicker a bit, uh, you again see a pretty significant change. So VZ using that as input has, uh, has an impact on, on the performance. Um, and if you start including more, like uh, the magnetic field data, uh, in addition to VZ, um, now we're getting even closer to, to what we see um, in the simulation, especially for something like this part. The smaller features that we see in the in the color or the divergence of the flows are, are better captured. And then you can go again all out and include continuum intensity as well. And and with that, um, there is maybe some improvement um, over using the magnetic field in VZ, but sometimes uh, it comes at the detriment of, of capturing other uh, features. So there is there seems to be a point where too much information um, kind of may have an impact on your flows. Um, so in terms of like this new sort of application going to active regions, I'd say it, it does fairly all right. Um, but then we can go to this kind of structure, which is we have a transition between two different polarities happening. This, this is the one that's been proven to be a bit more challenging for the neural network. So again, same structure as before, simulation, neural network in the middle, and then some of the properties on the right. Um, so if we use BZ or the vertical uh, magnetic field as input for the neural network, 
again, it seems to be producing a kind of a smoothed version of what the simulation is expecting. Um, I think the divergence itself is telling a lot if we look at the colors. Um, in terms of it seeing things, in terms of the divergence, especially here, it seems to be all this big coherent structure, which is not seen in the simulation. So it seems like, oh yeah, if you're just using BZ as input, some of the bit, some of the behavior is missing. And then we can switch to VZ and we see that this big component has been broken down into smaller ones. But in comparison, Z was allowing us to see something happening in the middle, VZ is not. So that input is missing something there, um, which in itself is interesting. And same thing at the bottom, uh, BZ was not seeing a lot of detail, VZ is starting to see more detail. But in comparison, um, the middle is missing. And then once you start including magnetic field, then you start recovering something more um, in the middle of the image in comparison to just using uh, VZ. And finally, um, and this is an example where it seems like using all the information available really helps. Um, we, we are finally getting something in the middle that's looking more and more like what we would expect uh, from the simulation and everything around it is starting to look more consistent as well. Um, so this is, this is a, a case where this changing between the different um, polarity regions really is, is really telling us something about the, the inputs that, that we should be using in comparison maybe to the other uh, subfields that we were focusing on. That's just an example of, of validation of the neural network. So we train a neural network on this simulation, we then applied it to, to that same simulation, and it seems to be recovering its behavior properly. And, and we can do this for an entire sequence uh, of that simulation. We have approximately 600 time steps, and you can compute the metrics uh, for, for all those time steps. And in general, it, it's pretty consistent over time. Um, if we're using the Spearman correlation coefficient, which is not the best metric, but just as an example. Uh, and we could look at the errors and everything, and it's honestly, the behavior is pretty much uh, consistent over time, except for a couple of places where we do see a, a small dips. Um, um, and those are, are caused by something that we see on the right. Uh, I think the number of time stuff is wrong. But you can see at some point in the simulation, there's this structure that starts happening, something like a wave is going to start propagating, which is something that uh, starts fooling the neural network in that region. That's because it hasn't captured that behavior. It's captured the rest. But if something like this happens, that's kind of unusual and, and might not have been part of its training set. For example, because we extracted random patches of random times when we were training, we didn't show full examples and we didn't show the full sequence either. Um, stuff like that starts fooling it. So that's an example of like, hey, if you apply this to observations that have this, it, it's probably not going to go well because it, it's not used to, to seeing this. Uh, but again, I think in terms of validation, it seems to be doing all right at recovering um, the general behavior of the simulation. Uh, I will skip to uh, example number three just in the sake of time, because I think it's more interesting. Uh, so with the previous example, what we did was we trained on the Murum 2019 simulation. For, for the following examples, I'll, I will basically do something very similar, uh, except we'll, we'll look at two versions of the neural network one that was trained on the Neurom 2012 simulation of a single sunspot, um, which is twice the spatial resolution of the other simulation, um, and also has very different penumbra. Um, so in the 2019 simulation, there was very little penumbra, or the penumbra was not kind of what, not really what you would expect from observations. Uh, it had like inflow-like structures. In the Murum 2019, 2012 simulation, sorry, you have a single sunspot, and it has this really nice um, uh, penumbra around it with outflows that look great. Um, and it is closer to what you would expect by looking at something like observations. Um, the difference between those two is usually associated with the upper boundary condition, that's usually how we generate uh, different penumbra. But basically, we'll, we'll train a neural network, uh, two versions of the neural network, to, to recover each of those simulations. And then we're going to test it out against the Murum, 29, uh, Murum 2012 simulation. So the one that has this nice uh, number that has outflows and everything. So in one case, we're basically doing like we were doing before. So we train on the same simulation, test it against the same. But for the 2019 simulation, basically, we're learning from that one and applying it to something that's different. It has a different penumbra. So there's a big question in terms of how is it going to behave. 
And for this, we're only going to focus on one specific combinations of inputs, which is BZ and BZ uh, for simplicity. So this is the simulation that I was mentioning from 2012. You have a single sunspot, um, has a nice amount of quiet sun around it, uh, which we'll also use for, for comparisons. But if we focus really on this part here, we see all this um, nice penumbra associated with the sunspot, which is very different from the previous simulation that I showed. So we're training one version of the neural network on this, and then we're training another version of the neural network on the previous simulation. So let's look at this case first. So again, very same structure as before. Um, simulation in the middle, neural network in, uh, sorry, simulation on the left, neural network in the middle, and some scatter plots on the right. Um, so for the neural network here, um, actually, yeah, this is a mistake at the top. It should be MUM 2012 um, is, is the training set. And the test set is, again, MUM 2012. So we're testing against the same simulation that we trained. Um, and in general, again, it is capturing kind of the behaviors that we're expecting. Uh, in the penumbra, there's a nice outflows. Um, the resolution is pretty high here, so it's hard to see all the details properly in terms of the flows. Uh, but then as you reach the quiet sun, we kind of recover uh, the behavior that, that we're expecting. So this is another case of like the neural networks kind of validated against the same thing that it was trained on. It looks all right. If we move to the 2019 simulation as a training set, so this one learned from very different penumbra. Um, and it looks like when you apply it to, to the 2012 simulation with the, with the outflows for the penumbra, it's actually doing all right. Um, it's not as bad. Like personally, I was expecting it to completely mess up the penumbra and, and predict, it, predict something completely wrong because it learned from uh, data that have very different penumbra. Uh, but visually, uh, which is not the best strategy. But if you do a visual inspection, it's actually not too bad. It, what it seems to be doing is almost associate phenomenal features to almost like extended granular features, which is interesting. Um, if, but if we look at our numbers, obviously they're not great. <laughs> um, when it comes to the small details of, of recapturing that different simulation, it's not doing as well as we'd like it to, to do. Uh, but it's still, it's still doing not as bad as, as one could expect. So it seems like joining on one simulation and generalizing to a different one isn't going as bad as it, it could have, although it could be definitely better. Um, and then we can do the same thing for a patch of Quiet Sun within that simulation. Um, so Quiet Sun should hopefully be easier to capture than, than some of those features. Uh, so again, if we go for the training set, and again, at the top, it should be saying the 2012 simulation, not the 2019 for this one. Um, so we're learning from the 2012 simulation and then testing against the 2012 simulation. Again, we're capturing the behavior as we would expect in the quiet sun. Um, the cellular patterns are there. They're divergent where they need to be. They're convergent where they need to be. And then if we move to the training data, that's from the 2019 simulation. And if I flicker between both, definitely a change in terms of what it is that it captures. It's not doing as well as when you train on the 2012 simulation, which is not shocking. But it's still not bad. Uh, in terms of generalizing from one simulation to a different one. It's um, merging, but yeah, if you look at the numbers specifically, they're still. This is just a, an example of like turning on one simulation, generalizing to a different one, um, which means that those neural networks are not just limited to uh, being applied to that simulation, same simulation they train on, which would be um, kind of sad if that was the case. Um, and now very briefly with like the last few minutes I have, uh, I'll show some work in progress that we had in terms of applying to HMI observations. Uh, and in this case, we'll actually use the 2019 simula uh, 2012 simulation of a single sunspot for training. Um, and then we'll apply to the uh, HMI observations. Um, just to show an example of what we get, but in this case, uh, we can't really provide a validation because we can't measure the transverse flows, um, but we'll, we'll save this for uh, once we get there. The big challenge that we have when moving to observations is this. Observations and simulations are, are different. Um, if we really wanted to talk about them on the same level field, we would have to talk about them from the perspective of having something like what we call an observation operator. Basically, you need to project, for example, in this case, you need to project your uh, simulation data um, into an observation space where you can then compare it into observations before you can do something. 
Uh, this is true from the perspective of neural networks also when it comes to the training. So if you want to use observations as input, you have to either prepare your training data, which is simulations, and make it look like observations or make sure that it has similar properties to observations. Or you have to take your observation data and project it in a space that's closer to the simulation data. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's going to be different than what it learned from. And as a result, you're going to get something that's nonsensical as output. So it's just, it's just kind of a, have to be careful with this. So we can take a simulation like I showed. This is the one from before in the 2012 neural simulation. But then you can transform it, uh, for example, by applying a point spread function to make it look more like uh, HMI observations. So this is what we did to the simulation data. And then this is what we use for training. Basically, data that was transformed um, into fake or synthetic HMI data. Uh, so this is an example of stuff that you would get. So on the left is a simulation uh, and kind of what it looks like. And then on the right is an example of actual HMI observations uh, of AR1158, um, just to show kind of the blurriness of the data in comparison to the original um, simulation data that we were studying. Um, and some of the questions is, is it going to be able to capture feature, the features properly? For example, in terms of the quiet sun, the umbra, uh, and the penumbra. Um, I'll, I'll try to go quickly, but this is another example of just validating the neural network. So when we learn from the simulation uh, that was transformed into synthetic HMI data, uh, it would look like something on the left. So that would be your simulation that's been transformed. And on the right is the neural network. And in general, again, it captures the behavior. So it, it learns to approximate what the simulation does, which is what you want it to do. But that's kind of like before, so there's nothing really new here. Uh, and again, depending on the inputs that you use, quicker between uh, both slides. Of course, the inputs seem to be having an impact on your. Same thing if we look at more of the umbra and, uh, and a bit of quiet sun region from the simulation, and that's been transformed into synthetic HMI observations. Um, it seems to be capturing the behavior that you would expect from the simulation with outflows for the penumbra, small flows in the umbra, and then the, the granular like patterns outside. Here, the combinations of inputs really has an impact in the penumbra, especially. It's very interesting. It's a similar analysis that I showed earlier. But then you can move, and I'll skip some of those slides just for the sake of time. Uh, but other cases, if, if, if the training simulation and the observations are too different, there can be some wild stuff happening. Like, here's an example that I've exaggerated. Uh, where we look at the continuum intensity, and let's assume that's the input we want to use. Um, you could have MIRIM have certain properties, but the HMI observations of um, properties, for example, are represented uh, as a red curve, or this is a cumulative histogram. Um, and MIRIM would be the um, orange curve, um, which you can see has some slight differences. But if I really exaggerate it, you could get a scenario that looks like this. So on the left, um, basically, this is a case where we would use uh, HMI intensity grams as input in our neural network, but the training was too different from the observations. The prediction for flows is basically nonsensical. It's just going in one direction, and it doesn't seem to be making any sense. Uh, we should be finding granular-like structures, but we're not. But if you do that preparation properly, you get something like, like on the right, where now you're actually recovering. Uh, cellular-like patterns that you would expect from granulation. So this is just an example of uh, making sure that what you're training on and what you're applying to has to be the same. Or, well, not the same, but similar. Um, and this applies to other things like how you prepare the data, for example, in terms of the darkening, because that's not in the simulation data. Um, so if you want to apply it to, to your neural network, train on simulations and apply it to observations that feature the darkening, there's going to be problems. Um, so you have to pre-process the data properly. So that it's closer to, to, to what it is that you train on. Uh, yeah, so these are very quick examples I'll you want to show. Uh, I, I think I have two or three slides left. Um, so on the left is an example of the Murum Quiet Sun subregion, uh, just for reference. In the middle is an example of a patch of Quiet Sun that we uh, reconstructed from HMI observations using a neural network that was trained to use intensity rooms as inputs. Um, and as you can see, it is finding cellular-like patterns. Um, 
at the location of the granules, but the flows are kind of weak in comparison to what we had in the simulation, uh, which is interesting. And it seems to be related to the different pro difference in properties between the intensity grams from the simulation versus the observations. But then if you do something like on the right, where you actually include magnetic field data as well, um, you, you, you see a change in the prediction that you have in, in the quiet sun um, flows uh, from HMI observations. So again, the influence of the input seems to be um, pretty interesting from the perspective of neural network. But the regions that we're more interested in is, is something more like uh, the, the active regions themselves. So we have AR1158, and if you focus on the subfield, like the red box here, um, these are the flows that your neural network would predict um, for it. And, and this, uh, the middle part is an example that was done uh, using only intensity grams as input. So we're basically getting outflows um, for the penumbra, very few, like very small flows in the umbra, and granular like flows uh, in the quiet sun, which is behavior that you would expect, at least from what you learned from the simulation. And I can show an example of that again on the left, like Miram versus uh, the neural network prediction for HMI observations. But on the right, we have an example again of a prediction by the neural network, where in this case, we we, uh, we didn't prepare the magnetic field data properly, I think. Um, so for example, the umbra, it overly, uh, like it really badly estimated the flows that it should be finding in the umbra. Like it is finding really large flows when it shouldn't be the case. Uh, but for the other regions, it is finding flows that are kind of okay in terms of the perspective, uh, from, from the perspective of what you would expect from, from what you learn from simulations. But in terms of, for example, if we look at the middle plot, how do we validate this? The best we can do for now is just compare it to other methods, uh, which is work in progress. Um, but there's definitely cases, for example, if the data has shearing in it, um, and you learn from a simulation like this that didn't have any shearing, uh, you're probably not going to be recovering it. Um, so there's scenarios like that that we need to evaluate to see what it is that um, the neural network is able to, 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 to generalize based on what it has uh, learned from the from perspective of simulations. So I'll quickly go through the conclusion. Uh, so basically, in this presentation, I showed uh, emulation of simulations using neural networks. Uh, so we approximate flows in different models using different combinations of inputs. And when it comes to the combinations of inputs, it looks like having VZ and also maybe BZ on top of it or what gets this optimal uh, mapping to transverse flows. When it comes to the application to observations, uh, our inferences really depend on the properties of uh, the input data, but as well as the training simulation data that you use for doing a lot. And one thing that we really need to focus on is how we go from simulations to observations. Um, and there's this model dependency that influences a lot if you're making inferences for um, from observations, but like I explained earlier, it might actually be useful for something like data driving or data simulation to ensure consistency with the simulation that you're putting the data in. And finally, this will be used um, at HO in terms of doing uh, driving boundary conditions for data-driven simulations from Urim. Um, and this will allow us to get some insight in terms of the properties of, the spatial properties of solar coronal heating uh, when we'll do a statistical analysis of the emission that's, made, that's uh, generated by uh, active regions that we observe or that we simulate through uh, data-driven simulations. And then one last point is, I mentioned there's a bunch of neural networks that we can use for flows. We're actually working on what we call a physics and formula network right now with Robert Yerlin at the University of Graz in Austria. Uh, so rather than just learning from a simulation and trying to learn that mapping, we actually have a neural network that's solving for the magnetic induction equation as well, uh, which would, should allow us to get flows that are more physical. Um, in comparison to trying to just approximate the physics in the simulations. And I'll, I'll hand here. Thank you, Ben, for an excellent talk. And um, now uh, it's open for questions. And uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand or just uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Matthias. Hi, Ben. Thank you for the very interesting talk. You mentioned that you had to do some matching of the intensity distribution to get good results. Do you have to do something similar also for magnetic field distribution and velocity when you use that as input? I mean, the reason I'm asking is, I mean, for the intensity, you have a large sample of granules. 
and you kind of know if if you see something different that's slightly a systematic effect which has to do with the fact that you don't account for all observation effects and degradation but if you deal like a quantity with magnetic field and you have a different distribution there's also one element in there which is simply due to the fact that you have a different active region which has yes. a different distribution so how do you account for the difference yeah so for, from that perspective we, we've not looked into this all that much like those uh that experiment with matching was one that was done purely on quiet sun and it was done on a scenario where we we actually had done a mistake in how we had prepared the data so it was for sure going to fail as we were going to transition to the observations uh once we found that mistake actually like we didn't need matching afterwards it was working fine uh but this is just something to illustrate kind of the differences like if, if we're you're training on something that's completely completely different of course you're going to get flows that make no sense but if you are able to adjust it in some way to make it match uh then you should be able to recover the kind of behavior that you want but yeah once you move to say active regions that are different than what you train on just like not just in terms of like magnetic field strength or something like just just the structures and everything um will we need processes like this it's a good question um and I think that's part of the stuff that we're going to try to evaluate. Like that, that's part of the reasons we're doing some of those generalizations between different simulations. Uh, so I showed one example here where things to, seem to be working well, but we might train on one simulation and try to apply to multiple different ones just to see if there's some sort of issue happening from the fact that those active regions are all different. Uh, but so far, there hasn't been a case where things went completely wrong. Uh, but this is going to be pretty important from the perspective of observations because yeah now things are going to be probably very different in terms of the structure that we find but i don't know if we'll have to rely on processes like this uh i'm hoping not because yeah how, how do you do it is the big question uh, how, how do you try to do this um sort of matching between things that are supposed to be different um is, is a big question i'm hoping that's where some this is where something like uh, a physics informed approach could help because it will no longer necessarily rely just on the simulations. It will have the physics do the solving inside the active region. Um, so it's going to be using like that vertical velocity, the magnetograms and everything to solve an equation rather than just being like, what is it that I learned from the simulation? So I'm hoping this will help from that perspective. But otherwise, yeah, there's a lot of questions. How do you go from two things that are different? Yeah. Other questions? You could just raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask your question. Maybe we have a follow up question. I mean, applying this to re observations, I mean, obviously. The best thing one should do is take a simulation and then do the entire forward modeling, compute the HMI line, and then run it through the HMI processing <laughs> pipeline to get really some something which looks HMI-like back from the simulation. Of course, the computation expense would be quite an, quite enormous to do this properly. But I mean, but even without doing it, I'm very impressed. I mean, how sensible the results look like. Do you have a feeling? I mean, do you think at least for some smaller set of simulations, we have to go the long way to really make sure we understand how all these effects could impact it? Or do you think we don't we have to go that far? Uh, yeah, that is a good question. I. <laughs> we should yeah, the, the best would probably be to have a look at it I, I go through that work and actually tell does it influence all that much or is it fine um yeah no i ideally we wouldn't have to but that'd be the hope um because yeah. because yes it would be it would be a lot of work but i think to be the the most consistent as possible we probably should or at least give that a try do a comparison between both cases and then determine from it do you, do you actually have to go through all the trouble or are you fine just with things as they are? Um, I, I think it'd be pretty interesting to look at, um, but yeah, it, it would be work. Mike? 
You are muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. So I'm just riffing off of a little bit uh, what Matthias was saying um, and some of the other stuff I've seen in the in the machine learning space. You wouldn't necessarily have to go all the way of, you know, running it through the, the mechanism to do the whole forward calculation and compute it all. You could create a, 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 a adversarial neural network yes. there to, to generate the the actual image from the data and then use that in the in the in the analysis process to, to get with that. I mean I've seen them do some stuff with with the SDO data, you know, using a couple of the other things to generate the other images to to see where you go with that. That might be a might be a more computationally friendly way to to get where you, you're you're nodding your head. I'll I'll shut up and let you talk. <laughs> No, no, that that that's a very good point. It's a very good idea, and it's actually something we have in the cards. Um, I, I've had the I have a, a colleague. Well, actually, his name is right here, uh, Robert Yerlin on this slide. For example, has worked a lot on translation uh, between images. Just going, for example, in this case, going from stereo data to SDO AIA like data. And this sort of process could be applied as well for 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 what we'd like to use as input in our in our project. Or for example, from going from simulation space to observation space or something like that. This is where a general generative adversarial network could come in. Um, so no, we, we have that in the cards. Um, cool. It'd be, I think, a pretty fun thing to experiment with. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, if not, let's th thank our speaker again for a very nice presentation. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.